Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love Online, and we are dealing with Isaiah chapter 1. God wants obedience, and obedience goes a lot further than what we think. So let's go there, shall we? Isaiah chapter 1, starting at verse 1 through 20. Ooh, this is going to be a hard message, y'all. So all I can say, like my former pastor used to say, buckle up. It's going to be a rough ride on this one. But if you can take it, you can make it. It's another one of his expressions. <laughs> okay. Quoting Pastor Cushman. All right. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They have gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken anymore? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. It's another way of saying empty, lifeless. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire, consumed. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. And it is desolate, is overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a small remnant, we should have been a Sodom. And we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full. It's another way of saying fed up. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Now, let me, I never saw this before. So let me show you what I saw when I read this. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. Now, incense was a form of worship. They would, you know, worship. It was like a way of sending up praise and worship to the Lord, different types of worship, different types of oblations to God. It's kind of like if I walk up to you and you know you're looking like crap. And you know I don't, I'm don't. i not even for you. And I'm saying, oh boy, it's been a long time. Boy, do you look good. And you know I'm really mocking you. You know, I never did like the way you look. Never liked the way you dress. Never liked your style. Pretty much never liked you. And I'm showering you with all these compliments in front of my friends. It's going to leave a sour taste in your mouth. Because you know it's a backhanded insult. You know it's a sarcastic insult. This, this person could care less about me and they showered me with all this bull. 
Well, that's kind of the way God feels with us sometimes. That's what that's saying. I never saw that before, but I'm seeing it now. Verse 14, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hated. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. We're going to deal with that evil in a minute. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, mm, mm, mm. let's get back to that word evil. We think of cussing, fussing, fuming, fighting, uh, uh, adultery, fornication, getting high, doing drugs, uh, being a drunkard, uh, brawling, doing everything that, that, that goes against God's standards. But what we don't address is the inner man. The inner man where God says seven things doth the Lord hate. Oh my goodness, I've got to go there, y'all. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. This is Proverbs chapter 6, starting at verse 16. A proud look, that's pride. A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Wow, I'm done. So a lot of times we don't realize that we're operating in pride. We shroud it and camouflage it. We we put a pretty costume on it called humility. But it's false humility. We put a pretty costume on it called uh, submission. But it's only, I'm only going to submit if I like what you're saying to me. If I don't like the way you said it, and I don't like the way you did it, and I don't like the way it smells, I ain't submitting. That's right. If I think I know more than you, I ain't submitting. There's a certain amount of arrogance, demanding arrogance and pride that runs in the body of Christ. It runs rampant and it's very subtle and we don't see it. And that's why it's a stench to God's nostrils because we think we're being ever so saintly we think we're being ever so holy and we either want to be a guide to the blind or we think we have all the answers or we think that we are chosen because there's something really special about us that God really needs to use the body of Christ really needs me or we think well I do this and I do that and I do the other. Ergo, life ought to be a bag of chips for me because I earn this right. I earn this. It's, it's, like, it's like this. This is the attitude we have to God a lot of times. 
It's not that we fear God. We fear the whooping. We don't always fear God. We just fear the whooping. That's why you have so many disobedient kids in, the, in these last days. You tell a child, I want you to go clean up your room. It's a mess. The child goes in the room pouting with an attitude because they wanted to go out and play. So now they got their bottom lip poked out. And they go in there to clean that room. But they're not really cleaning it. They're throwing everything in the closet. Check it out. Check it out. Check it out what I'm saying. They're throwing their junk in the closet. They're shoving their toys under the bed, right? They just throw the cover over and they sit down and they turn the TV on and they're ready to get back to their thing again. Mama Sita walks in the door, looks under the bed, opens up the closet, says, no, 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 you didn't clean this room. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. I want you to do the other. And you're looking at her like, that's not fair. I, I, I cleared out the room. It's not messy anymore. But you didn't do what she said. You did it your way. You did it in the way that it is convenient for you. And that's what we do as adults. We obey God on our terms when it's convenient for us. When it works for us, not when it's inconvenient, not when it hurts. No, we don't obey in those areas because we want it our way. We want life our way. We are Americans. We have a sense of entitlement. I deserve to get this and I deserve to get that. So when things don't work out, we don't look in the mirror and wonder, well, what did I not do in order for that not to work out? Or what bad judgment call did I make? Or life itself, you know, we live in a fallen world, so bad things happen to good people. But we immediately cop an attitude and we're quick to want to walk away from God or walk away from God's people. Like Peter said, it's their fault. It's his fault. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says, it's not my brother, it's not my sister, but it's me, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. You remember the old expression in the streets, sound like a personal problem to me. Well, see, we take that personal problem that God is trying to show us. We cuss somebody out. We ball them out. We storm out. We have a hissy fit. We have an adult temper tantrum. We turn on the, the little X-rated movies when nobody's looking. We grab the magazines and we work it. And then we sit up there and we hang out here and we do that. And God's saying, I miss my time with you. These moments together, I want to be with you each day, but it hurts me when you say you're too busy, too busy trying to serve me. But how can you serve me when your spirit's empty? There's a longing in my heart, wanting more than just a part of you. It's true. I miss my time with you. So yeah, on one hand, you do one or two favors for the Lord, like shoving your clothes in the closet and shoving your toys under the bed. But you're not really doing a cleanup job. You're not sweeping, you're not dusting, you're not wiping off the furniture, you're not making the bed the way your mother taught you. You're not putting your toys in the areas they belong, categorizing them, putting them in their rightful place. You're just shoving your little mess and a junk that's on the floor with it under your bed so it doesn't show. But you are not dealing with what's going on. Now, remember God talked about sores and wounds and putrefying sores and 
or and that they're not healed. Listen, there is not one person on the face of this earth that does not have an emotional scar somewhere tucked in their back pocket. But 99 and 9 tenths percent of us don't deal with them. If you want healing, if you want deliverance, that's a good thing. You keep asking for it. But while you're asking, you obey in every area you can. Because a lot of times, baby, the healing comes through your acts of obedience. It's like it's time for your allowance at the end of the week. Papa got his paycheck. So he comes home and it's time to work out the bills. And what's left, now we get you guys together to hand out the allowances. Well, what's Pop going to ask you? Did you clean your room like your mother asked you to? Did you take out the trash on Wednesday? That's your day to take out the trash. Oh, you forgot. Wait, 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 wait. What'd you say? You forgot? Oh, how convenient. But your mother didn't forget to get up in the morning before school and fix your breakfast, did she? She didn't forget, and she's not getting paid to do it. But you forgot. And you still want me to hand you your allowance. Think about how we think of God. It's like, give me, give me, my name is Jimmy. Give me, give me, give me my blessings. Give me my this, give me my that. Come on, Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me. And God's saying, what have you done for me lately? Now, I ain't talking about getting out there and witnessing. I ain't talking about none of that right now. I'm talking about you in your backyard, your closet, under your bed, in your cellar. What are you doing for me? What are you doing with me? Do you even think on me? Or do you think of me as that big can of raid getting ready to spray you when it's time for you to get your booty work? We want the best from God. We want God's promises. We want his blessings. We want everything that he has in his covenant. We want him to fulfill his side of the contract. We give God our dirty laundry. We give God our attitude. We give God his way only when it works for us. If it ain't convenient, it ain't happening. He just got to understand. I'm hurting. He just got to understand. They did me wrong. He just got to understand. Well, I'm tired. He just got to understand. Listen, I'm guilty of this too. I'm not talking about you like it's all on you. I'm guilty of this too. I have to ask God to forgive me a lot of times for, for laziness. Straight out laziness. Just don't feel like praying. Just don't feel like spending hours reading the word. I want to watch a movie. I want to do something fun. Well, spending time with God is fun, but we lose sight of it. The more you do it, the more fun it becomes because the more you do it, the more you engage and you start to sense his presence. The more you sense his presence, the more beautiful it becomes, the more fun it gets, and the more you long for it. But when you have a casual approach, when you have a casual approach to seeking God, when you have a casual approach to reading his word, When you have a casual approach to pouring your heart out to him. You know why the Israelites journey took 40 years rather than 13 days? Because when God sent out the 12 spies, Joshua and Caleb came back with a positive 
confession. They may not have been certain, but they said they agreed with what God said. We are more than able and God is more than able to give us the victory. We can go in and possess this land. What did the 10 spies, the other 10 spies say? No, we are grasshoppers in our own eyes and they were like giants. There's just no way. So what they said in essence was, God ain't going to do that. God can't give us the victory. That's just a bunch of lip service. There's no way he can do that. Did you see them people? You see how big they were? They're bigger than me. Shoot, I ain't going in there. You crazy. After God said, go in and possess it. Go spy out the land, see what I got for you. And God ain't going to send you anywhere. God's not going to tell you to do anything. God's not going to require anything of you that he is not going to give you the ability to do, the power to do, the equipping to do. He's going to give you the, the ability to accomplish the very thing he told you to do. He stacks the deck in your favor. But you sitting up there saying, no way. Uh, I ain't going to be no fly. I ain't going to be no fool. You better be a fool for God. Because see, when you slap God in his face saying what he ain't going to do, you, you draw out your trial. You draw out the struggle. You make it last so much longer. Why? You look at what they did in the Old Testament. That's why y'all need to read the Old Testament. Everything you say God ain't going to do. Think about it. A lot of y'all, you don't think God's going to rescue you when your house is in foreclosure? You don't think God's going to make a way where there is no way? So you panic and you run and you just put your hands up. You don't seek God for instruction. You don't ask God what to do in this case. Can he come in and intervene, tell you what to do, rescue you from day to day? Some people are in foreclosure two or three years and God work makes a way where there is no way. And then some people are in foreclosure and they walk away and never ask God what to do about it. So they don't get their answer because they're not expecting one. And what happened? The Jews had to wander through the wilderness 40 years because of what God wasn't going to do. And they ain't going to be no fool getting up out there what god brought us out here to kill us moses brought us out here for us to die in the wilderness that's not faith that's not trust that's living in a condition of panic if i tell you no if you tell me let's put it on you so you can know how it feels if you tell me you live right next door to me and you tell me tomorrow I'm going to take you to the store. I'm going to take you to the bank. I'm going to treat you to lunch. And I call you that night before. You ain't going to take me to no bank. You ain't going to take me to the store. You ain't going to take me to, to lunch. I don't know why you, you know, why you even say that. You ain't going to do that. How would that make you feel? You're doing it from your heart. You're trying to help me. And I'm spitting on your good intentions, spitting in your face. Oh, you talking a bunch of crap. You ain't going to do nothing for me. It'd make you not want to do it, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it make you not want to do it? Think about it now. Come on, be human, be real. Don't nobody do nothing for me. No, 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 no. You ain't going to do it either. So don't even, hey, hey, don't even waste my time. I don't want to hear it. Hmm. I'll be like, okay, well, since that's what you believe, then that's what you get. I can do a whole lot more with my day than take my time up with somebody that's got that kind of attitude towards me. I'm true to my word. So, if you, hey, that's cool. You have it your way, baby. I guess I ain't going to do it then. I'll see you next week. Yeah, that's right. Gone. I knew you weren't going to do it in the first place. Okay, bye. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
That's the way we do God. We allow our scars, our wounds, our fears, our doubts to just smear stuff all in his face. Then we rationalize it. See, the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, some others of you, you pamper your little pet sins. <laughs> I love this one. Let me see here. What can I grab? Well, let's just mind this one. Okay. Here, my baby. It's my baby. Yeah. It's my favorite one right here. This is where I go to when I'm upset, when I'm sad, when I'm discouraged, when I'm down on myself, and I just want to wallow in my self-pity. So this is my little self-pity. Meet the church. Church meets self-pity. This is my baby right here. And see, self-pity when I'm feeling like this, <laughs> Ah, what's the big deal? I go to the store and buy me a pack of cigarettes and puff away. I'm not going to God. I'm going to a pack of cigarettes. That's my little self-pity. Oh, yeah. I know you're feeling down. So, you know what you want to drink? Come on, let's go to the bar and get a drink. So you go to the bar. You don't go to God. You don't go to God to get the victory over the self-pity. You wallow in it with all your little adult pacifiers. Self-pity. I just do so poorly in this, that, and the other. So why don't we make ourselves feel good and let's go to the X-rated movies. You want to do that? Come on, let's do something that feels good because I'm feeling down right now. Yeah, that's right. You're my baby. You're the only one that understands me. And at the same time, you're saying, Lord, deliver me from self-pity. Deliver me from this. Deliver me from that. And as soon as things don't go your way and you're not feeling on top of the world, you grab your baby, your sidekick, and you say, let's go run to some mischief, shall we? Think about that. We allow... We give the keys to our front door to Satan and say, now, I don't want you in my life, but if I need you, I call you. And how do you call on Satan? Through your disobedience. You figure God is a loving God. God is a merciful God. God is a forgiving God. So I can dabble in a little bit of that, and dabble in a little bit of that, and I'm okay because God loves me. You ain't got no excuse to commit sin just because it's convenient and you felt like it. How dare you? What would have happened if when my husband couldn't walk and my husband couldn't see and my husband couldn't have sex because he had a frontal lobe stroke. If I went across the street when my needs needed to be met and I went with my neighbor and had sex once every two or three years. Well, God understands. I mean, he loves me. Come on now. Huh? Really? See, On one hand, we want to be obedient. We want to seek God. We want to live this holy life. We want to please him. But on the other hand, we make allowances. We make provisions for the flesh. And we think it's okay because we just had a down moment. Right when you're in the middle of doing what you're doing, God could split the clouds. And when he splits those, those clouds, baby, it is eternally too late. See, we think that it's okay. Now, we know that the provision for us was Jesus Christ. That's our forgiveness. We get that. But we don't realize how we use all kind of little spiritual and 
and convenient excuses to make our way to mischief when God wants more. He doesn't just want you to be forgiven. He doesn't just want Jesus in your heart. He doesn't just want you to ask God for forgiveness. He wants you to act like you mean it. Now, let me give you an example. My mother, <laughs> she would have me do the dishes and she used to call me a bull in the china closet. I was so athletic, I didn't know my strength. And I'd be washing a glass, right? And that poor glass would break right in my hand. First time I did, I was like, oh, mom, I'm so sorry. And I thought she was going to get mad. Mama told me, she said, Pat, you don't know your strength. You've got to learn to harness that. But you never have to apologize for breaking something. It's not something you did on purpose. It's not like you took the glass, had a hissy fit, and threw it up against the wall. It's a mistake. Okay. This is what I want to share with y'all. Stop calling sin a mistake. A mistake is a mistake. Sin is sin. Now, God gives us a lot of leeway, y'all. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of sins we have not had to pay for. Based on his mercy. But don't take that to the bank and think you can ride on it for the rest of your life. God says, my spirit will not always strive with you. I ain't going to tell you this another time. See, the biggest problem with the church now, the same way we don't fear authority, we don't fear God. Why? He's invisible. We're told he's a loving God. We think because we've been saved forever, we can, you know, we're on his good side now. You know, we're in like Flynn. So we can, you know, we can relax a little bit and, you know, yeah, you know, do a little something, something on the side. No, no. To whom much is given, much is required. The more God has done for you, baby, the more he requires of you. Don't take him for a patsy. Now, he loves us, and he understands when we're caught up because of emotional scars. But don't sit on your emotional scars as a license to allow you to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, at any given time, just because it's convenient through grace and forgiveness. There was one time I committed a sin one time too many. And I was starting to stretch the envelope and take his grace for granted. And as I was driving home, I felt the Lord's anger and it scared the boo-boo out of me. I pulled my car over to the side. I said, I'm going to get this thing. I'm going to pull in my reins and get it together. I've taken you for granted too long. Please give me one more chance. And I straighten my act up quick, fast, and hurry. See, some of y'all need to feel his wrath. And some of y'all need to feel his love. There are some kids you can stare at. You do it one more time here. And you don't have to lift a belt. You just give them that look. And they straighten up because they don't do pain. Other kids, you got to practically beat them upside the head before they get it together. No pain, no gain for some. I want to always be easily entreated. I don't want to be whooped upside my head before I get the message. I don't want to have to pay all kind of consequences before I get the point. God is not to be played with. God is not to be mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Please, 
be diligent to obey. We all have those moments where we fall into a sinkhole. We fall into a trap, but we don't set up camp and use it as our address and make excuses for it. Year in, year out, year in, year out. A woman told me this years ago, she was saved. And she told me she wasted 12 years of her life dating a married man. Waiting for him to divorce his wife so they could finally get together. He played her like a fiddle. He manipulated her. He seduced her. Everything in the world. She was at his beck and call. Can you imagine what God felt like that whole time trying to get her to line up? He didn't take her to hell. And when she finally woke up and smelled the coffee, because God deals with us after needs a lot of times, that was an area where she was needy. But it's not an excuse. It was just a blessing that Jesus didn't split the clouds at that time. So now she's walking the straight and narrow like she's supposed to. Thank God for his grace, patience, long suffering, and mercy. Don't play it. Don't play him.